So welcome to It's Not All About the Numbers, the leadership podcast that doesn't just focus on the bottom line. My name is Chris and that is Mike. Hi everyone. And our co-host this week is Alex Bond Burnett, founder of Ambitious Ambition Impact. I like Ambitious Impact. I might change it. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm tripping over your name. Uh, you know, thanks for the tip of uh, going for Alex <laughs> rather than Ale- Alexandra. Um, and I, for some reason, I, I think of uh, French when I say Bond Burnett. So is, that, is it Bonbon Bonbonette? It should. So, it sounds like it should be, shouldn't it? Bond Burnett. Yeah. Bond Burnett. I like Maybe that. said with a French accent. <laughs> So how's everybody's week been? Uh, obviously a, a busy week in the world of, of Chris Argent and Jen CFO, but Mike, come to you first. Can I just do this in my normal accent or do you want me to do it in a foreign? French. No, I'll, I'll stick in my French, normal accent. French or bumpkin um, is fine. It, it's been it's been a really good week, actually. So obviously I was part of your the, the uh, Gen CFO Academy fund, running a couple of sessions and launching this podcast, which which was great. I spent quite a lot of time recharging with some Xbox with my son this week because the weather's been awful. So it's been quite nice to sit down. Um, and I suppose the really key work thing for me, as well as the Gen CFO Academy, is launching uh, the data practices work I've been doing with the Open Data Institute, which got launched on Tuesday, to uh, quite quite positive response. So I'm quite happy with that. Yeah, good week. Uh, it sounds interesting. I never had you down as a gamer. I... I don't think we've ever spoken about this. Well, well kind of like, I, I suppose, 20 years ago, maybe. Now I play like two games and that's it. Wow, it's, okay. It's, so I've got an Xbox to play one racing game and that's it. Because I just I think, the time. I think it's going to happen. I think it's going to happen. My son's 10. You know, Alex, you were saying your son's six. I think at some point we're going to have to get involved. But how, how was your week? Yeah, yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. I just can't. I've, li- I've literally just come back from a, a speaking job, um, so it's nice. It's nice to get out of the office. And so my my days can be really varied. I can either be traveling for like a week or two, or then just be what I call grounded back in back in the office. This has been an office week, but ended the day, ended the week on a half an half an outing. And were you on a road show recently? Did I see that? Yeah, I was on the ACCA roadshow, uh, oh. which was great fun. So I went to Bristol and um, and I just I, I was a speaker there and I did then a panel and then uh, and then they invited me out to the um, to follow them to London. And I was the MC for the day at the Oxo Tower. So that was great fun. No one wants to hear about what I'm talking about. I've done this week because it's been all over social. But uh, I was running Gen CFI Academy for our online community it it just blew up it was fantastic uh three days of content and I think the biggest compliment I had was someone pings me um via the community personally and just sort of said and I read this out and I think I'm going to put it on the wall but it was simply a learning and community building masterpiece exemplar and I was just like oh I, I gonna honestly it's been such a four or five years in the making um and I feel like uh that that felt like I'd, I'd arrived when I read that one which is fantastic and on personal side my, I actually Mike I was in your neck of the woods recently uh, I went down to see my uncle down in Dorchester who's uh he's a bit of an innovator himself but more on the medical side uh and uh he gave me a bit of a lecture about leadership and uh actually reminded me that he went to uni with uh, king charles which was <laughs> which i completely forgot i did know that when i was a kid because it was on the wall but um but yeah i've, got a, I've, I've got a quick question for you chris so mm. obviously the academy's been this week and it's mm. been you had three full-on days of of stuff and it was great what did you do in the evenings to chill out to kind of get yourself back for the next day? Because I always find those kind of days really exhausting. And I suppose, yeah, what what, what did you do? It's a great shout, actually. Um, so we were all working, you know, this is a peek under the bonnet. You know, we're all celebratory and publicly it's fantastic. Um, and behind the scenes, it was fantastic as well. But we were doing, you know, 12, 14 hour days um, and then having to host and sort of be on it you know and publicly be on it and you know Alex I know that you present a lot as well you know that that's sort of public face and private face you know you have to sort of switch on and off so I um unlike me I was actually quiet at home 
you know, I basically just just didn't do much. I was silent. Uh, didn't really want to watch TV in the normal way. Uh, I think I took a quiet quiet bath and tried to avoid bedtime. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, it's a really good point because you do have to recharge your batteries in between these, um, you know, these public moments. You know, Alex, any tips for that? How 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 do you go about it when you're on stage? Well, I think I, it depends. What that's usually about is the whole extrovert introvert thing, which is where do you get your energy from and and the kind of all ambivert, which is I think I sit on a bit of both. So when I'm up there, I feel like really energized and like I'm I'm in my element. And but then afterwards, yeah, I'm with you. I kind of like a quiet train ride or at least going back to my hotel room and just having some quiet time to down uh uh, to down tools as it were and just (laughs) zone out a bit um and and weirdly the pandemic really impacted me in that way so it was like massive I'd be out all the time loving it going up on stage presenting doing a lot of that I do a lot of I'm, I'm a trainer obviously I do coaching and training so I do a lot of facilitation work as well which is very much like you're performing anyway and and that would energize me um and of course I was kind of locked away in this in this room with my with my laptop and although you're talking to people um I found that then when we got back out there I think it was like the first contacts that came back on after the pandemic I was exhausted absolutely drained I actually booked in my day like I'd done my talks and then I had and then of course you got the parties afterwards but I actually had went back to my hotel room and had a little nap <laughs> had a, had a light, or I say a nap I lay there and just stared at the ceiling I think for a bit before to get the energy recharge get the energy to go back out again and then uh and then go again the next day and uh so I think the only thing to say is really listen to where your energy is and if you're someone that does need to recharge make sure you're actually booking that in so you can show up again and not yeah. drain yourself out yeah how an app disco nap whatever you want to call it <laughs> you know it seems it, it it certainly works so ju- just moving on to uh what's going on in the world this week um Hopefully you can hear this, but this kind of summed it up for me. AI, 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 generative AI, generative AI, generative AI, 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 AI. It uses AI to bring AI, 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 AI. Got the message? Yeah. Was it about AI? AI. It was what? That was the week, right? Because and not it was publicly uh it was all about ai you know my the academy was all about sort of gen ai and technology but i think that sort of summed it up this week it was it seemed like the whole world was talking about generative ai and the impact on people and how we need to kind of you know lean into this change it's sort of a human change as much as a um a technology change and we had the fantastic um, Nina Schick, who did a, a keynote on Gen AI as part of what we were doing this week. And uh, she kind of explained this in in sort of global terms. She's actually got a background um, working in sort of geopolitics. And she was saying that this is a bit of a watershed moment, really, because she was seeing it through the view through the eyes of population and government and planning and just sort of saying that this is the shift that people have been waiting for in terms of gen ai in terms of ai um and then we had uh, a guy from the director of ai from ibm talking about what's kind of happening under the bonnet and but there's a sort of an economy and a land grab for this technology as well was sort of how important it is and it's it feels a little bit like you know social media happening all over again you know people are trying to get ahead of this technology and and control it and make their millions you know mike you've been part of the odi conference what was that like well so, so the o, the odi conference was very much about ai and the intersection between um, ai and and data as you can imagine the the interesting reflection that i heard from somebody at at, at that conference was you obviously had the ai summit the week, week before in Bletchley Park, where um, Rishi was interviewing Elon Musk, and there were other good things going on as well as that. Um, yeah. But nobody apparently in that conference was talking about the data that underpins the generative AI and where the information is coming and how how the uh, messages come through. So one of one of the things that was really strong in the ODI conference was about um, 
without data, there is no AI. You have to have the data to train the AI. And actually to have good AI and trustworthy AI, you have to have good data and trustworthy data. And that that was a really strong message that came that came out, out from um from the from that conference for me. And I think it, it it's just really interesting how we've almost gone to that black box model of AI now. It's almost like it's there, it, it just works. And actually we're not really looking at its impact and what it does and how it makes us think. Alex, what's your take on this? You know, it's uh it's very much part of the the accounting and finance debate at the moment. If you were on a roadshow with uh, a bunch of accountants, was is this being talked about much? Oh yeah, I mean, I think it's still as with anything, and especially when we when we're talking about data and and how how clean your data is and everything like that, it always relies on humans to do it. Um, so a lot of the conversation is always about well. You know, it's a, it's a bit like the whole thing about how good your bookkeeping <laughs> and, uh, in terms of your reporting and your forecasting. Um, AI and generative AI is only trained on us. So it's going to have human flaws. And I think that is what the conversation is, is are we prepared um, for the, I suppose that com- it's actually a compliance question in a sense, as if we're using generative AI, who is going to check it? and who is going to uh, look at it and be creative with it and what input is going into it and who is influencing that input. It's 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 a great point, actually. I think a lot of people are sort of assuming that whatever is coming out of a Gen AI prompt tool, whatever it is, it's fact. And and we had and people take it as fact and then they run with it and then actually they need to remember actually maybe I should validate this a little bit or fact check this you know and and what about the data underneath and you know before we've talked about this in the past Mike you know performance of algorithms vary so it's not like it's always right um, it's actually it's always wrong but how wrong is it I love it and I, I think there's there's a lot of philosophical debate around this at the moment right it's not just uh, let's use the technology and on we go. We've even had the tech leaders. You talk about Rishi and uh, Elon Musk. You know, we've had people calling out, "Oh, can we have a six month delay on Gen AI because we're not entirely sure where it's going?" The, yeah, the genie I, doesn't know, go. The genie's not going back in the bottle, though, right? It, it, yeah. it, it's, it's out, it's out there, and it's, it's happening. I think the, the in, in what you were just saying there, that's I think that again links back to the conversation I've been having on on the data practices work I've been doing and thinking about. By that side of it is that transparency and trustworthiness bit is how do you demonstrate if you're if you're creating uh, an ai model or an algorithm that actually the way that you're doing it is in, a, is, is in a trustworthy way and one of the ways of doing that is being transparent about how your algorithm works and where the data is coming from we talked chris um a few months ago now when we were doing one of our mastermind sessions around uh the story a few years ago, so way before Gen AI was a mainstream thing about the the insurance company whose models that they were using to price insurance. Um, if all other things were equal apart from the ethnicity of the na- person's name, you got different results around pricing. And that's how easy it is for bias to creep into a computer program algorithm system. Alex, yeah, I can what- see you. I can see you. Yeah, yeah Alex. Yeah, sorry, uh, jumping in, I was just I was saying that's why it's really important, I think, for for leaders to really work on their elements of self-awareness, because um, bias will be creeping into practice and process. And unless you are actively having, putting a process in to really check in with your human bias, and 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 I'd like to approach that and say some people really clam up when you say unconscious bias and it's like, oh my God, but but we all have bias. That's how brains work. Um, that's mm. our own internal algorithm is that we've learned something in the past or we've inherited something, a belief or um, uh, a fear or, or anything like that. We lean towards certainty and safety and therefore that's our go-to with our brain functions and unless you actually challenge well actually do I know that to be true um you know then then it's it's like well that's it's like going somewhere if you're going to I don't know the hospital or the shopping mall or something like that and you go well the best route is this way um because you've always done it that way then you won't ever go well actually that's that's what my dad used to do or that's what the person before me used to do maybe 
can I just check that? Can I just, maybe I should just check that a new route hasn't opened up or somewhere didn't open up another lane or there's a faster or better way of doing that. And that will translate. I mean, regardless of AI, that always translate into, translates into processes and to ethics and to yeah. all sorts of areas of how we develop businesses. So I think it's now more than ever, we're kind of in this wild west, which is why you're having the, the meetings up in Bletchley Park, because there is no rule. There's, there's, there's no rule to say, uh, to guard anything, and we don't know what to do, which is why I think it was Italy and various countries started banning chat GPT. So they're like, whoa, we don't know what this can do. But they're acting out of fear. We're acting yeah. out of, I think, excitement and trying to get ahead of the curve. And there's a, you know, I think it's, I think we need to accept that the governance is always going to follow the change a little bit on this. It's moving so fast. Um, and I think there's, you know, I, I love the opportunity and you know, I'm excited by the opportunity. But and, and knowledge is power, I think, in this place of innovation, because, you know, the closer you get to these things, like I was saying about the, um, the director of AI was talking about LLMs and the, the sort of the language models behind Gen AI. And, you know, it was mind blowing. But when you boil it down, you know, it's it's sort of statistics which you can get your head around and there's a human role in translation of this stuff um as we said about checking and validating all the rest of it and there's you know as you just said there alex you know it's like there there are assumptions that are being made by ai that we need to check whether it's a route to the shop or whether it's the kind of connections that it makes you know like um you know, bigger buildings have bigger fires. So we need to build small buildings because then they will only have small fires. You know, these sorts of correlation and causation sort of things, it's all really... But the closer we get to it, right, Mike, it, it, the, the, the the more we understand it, the more we're aware of it, the more comfortable with it, right? I think, I think so. I mean, as you were talking there, something that went through my head is that this is not the first time that humans have come across a technological step change, right? Um, so I, the one that went through my head is that when the cars were, cars were first invented and started going on the road, there were no speed limits. They, they didn't say which side of the road you dro- drove on, you know, such like. And it was only when accidents started to happen that those things started to get put in place. In my hometown. So, uh, in my hometown. First speed limit in the in the world, I think. <laughs> 10 miles an hour in Harrow on the Hill. And, well, is it, and to carry on with that analogy, of course, the same thing. I think what we know, hopefully, what I hope I say will happen is that we'll have learned actually from that because we still have cars that are only built for one person and one way of thinking. And cars are still only really tested for male crash test. Yes, yeah, absolutely. So if you're thinking then in terms of AI, we also need to make sure it suits a whole range of uh, and and diverse way of either thinking or processes and things like that. And I think that's the, is it a danger? I don't know. It's certainly uh, something to consider. That's a, fant- that's a fantastic point. Uh, and it links back to your point about the, the inherent bi- bias that's everywhere, right? And the, you know, the crash test dummy is all being average male size and all the tests, tests on cars mm-hmm. are that I complete, completely, yeah, completely agree. That is really worth following through. The the other just just thinking back to a conversation again, another conversation that, that I'd heard was we 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 treat the output of some of these algorithms as fact, as as you said earlier, Chris. But somebody said something recently around they should just be another input. It just a, it should be another source that you fact check like any other source. So they can be great. They can streamline things. Like they can make things. Like large language models can make things you understand things faster but you should always check with another source just to just to make sure that that what you're seeing is is right and if you treat it like that i think it, you as a user are safer so I have, this, go on, I have this theory um that what we'll end up becoming is just the creators and the editors uh and that is the the future of kind of work is that our the everything will be done generative ai will be stepping into the doing uh, parts of work we are the ones that have to be the the fact checkers the um the content creators because we put the ideas in like it will know what to do but only if someone tells it what to do um and it's got to be so then actually there's 
are leaning into creative and critical thought. In I, I think that that absolutely, and just sort of following that thread, the, the thing that you can't program an AI to do yet, and you might be able to in the future, is is around empathy and understanding and that that real, hu- the human element of stuff. Um, you know, could, could a generative AI become a counsellor? Probably not. Uh, Certainly not at the moment, yeah. you know. And, and I think that examining that and thinking about that, you know, what are the jobs that humans actually uniquely place to do it's that's a great um segue mike because i I think the we we talk about how we should be using sort of ai and how it shouldn't be treated as fact and i think that's always been the case you know i I remember a ted talk quite a long time ago now about humanistic ai and it was always about just speeding things up for us but not necessarily doing the whole shebang you know it it takes us 90 percent there but then we are the magic 10 percent before we make any decision or present anything or, 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 you know, whatever it is. And that that 10% <clears throat> is maybe 10% of the effort, but it might be 90% of the value, right? So, and that's the human intervention. That's our human context checking, you know, our business acumen, our emotional intelligence, you know, the qualities that we have as, as humans. Um, and... You know, Alex, you work in this in- industry, like in a in a Gen AI world, right? The humans in the middle of this still. So, what what is it that they're bringing? Do you know? Um, have you have you come across R- Rory Sutherland from Ogilvy at all? Uh, I know Ogilvy, but no, not Rory. He's uh, he's got a great TEDx talk in a book called Alchemy. And now he's the chairman of Ogilvy. He's uh, worked a lot on their creative and and things like that. And and actually, advertising is a brilliant. Uh, industry to learn from because it is about de- data but also com- connecting to humans and influencing humans um, and his whole book alchemy is about the fact that uh here's a great quote that humans no more run on logic than horses run on petrol um, and it is about that what you're talking about those human elements that 10 percent is the magic or illogicalness of being human. And that is the fact that no matter where you go and what you do, you're going to have to deal with a human and you're going to have to deal with their emotions and their motivations and their values. And, uh, and as much as, you know, in a sense, it'd be great, wouldn't it? That we just set something off and it works and it runs. Um, Humans need to be uh, connected with. And And we we can see that playing out already, right? I I hadn't thought about the advertising industry, but there's been a lot of talk about Gen AI taking creative jobs, you know, immediately, marketing, copywriting jobs immediately. But actually, from my own experience and talking to a few other people, this sort of 90, you know, let's call it 80-20, it's because Pareto's been there forever. This 80-20 is actually playing out already where where gen gen ai might be producing you know advertising campaign with a wonderful tone of voice for it's not all about the numbers podcast but then the 20 percent that we're adding is this humanness right it's it's looking at it and saying no that doesn't sound right or that's not right for my audience or this is going to have more of an impact you know this is pleading to the emotions that the ai can't get so this is already playing out so we need to just nail this 20 percent, which is double 10 to 10 percent, which makes it sound even more important you know 20 percent of the the humanness right but Mike, you know you, you were at the odi was there any conversation about that human you know in the middle um so so yes and it was very i, I mean some of what i've said was sort of parroting things that i was hearing there in some respects around around the the need for for, for humans around the edges that I, I was just thinking when you said alex about you know it'd be great if we could just set things running and we could just you know sit back actually that'd be so dull wouldn't it the world would be so dull if everything was just working and it is actually that putting your putting your brain to things and thinking laterally around topics that, that make things interesting um the, the, just on advertising one of the things that i've always found really interesting is the way that apple advertise their products versus how other computer companies advertise their products and again this is lifted from simon sinek's um start with why right why, yeah but but it it's such a great example of when you're buying something 
you can look at all of the facts and that's probably what you would get logically presented to you. And it is what you get presented logically with, but actually it doesn't touch you, doesn't necessarily, and that's the, the Apple approach is, you know, touch the humanness of you, then you're more likely to buy it. And I think, you know, a, a really good illustration of, of, of what you're talk, what we're talking about. They're talking, there's a, the theory of movie trailers um, in terms of how you influence people to do things or take on new ideas or interest them in an idea, um, for instance. And it's about having the perfect blend of familiarity and also intrigue um, and, and un, I suppose, the unfamiliar. And um, so you have to connect the two. So that's what Apple kind of have looked at. And it's really powerful how they look at how do we make this brand new, completely alien concept um, familiar and not terrifying. And I think any finance professional who has had to present to the board or present a new idea or ask about implementing a new technology, who's gone, this seems completely alien to you. Um, and they have, you know, they, that will be familiar going, I've got to, I've got to be the translator, which is something you just said, Chris. It's like, I've got to be the translator of, of what I know that's very technical and very alien to other people. And, and especially when technology and AI is changing so fast, what we're having to do is then go, well, how do we make this familiar and not scary so that people adopt it and take it on? All, all, all this all this talk about advertising and, and marketing, and it, it's, it, I think it's a great reference for us, actually, because when I talk about the change that's happening in, in you know, my profession, sort of accounting and finance, well, it's already happened a bit before. Um, you know, there's a whole digital marketing career now. And like you said, you know, Ogilvy would be very data driven and, and digital first as an organization. But, you know, you, you go back to the Mad Men days and it's all, you know, paper and, and billboards. Um but you just you reminded me about this sort of humanness. Um, there was I was listening to a podcast uh, called Nudge. Oh yeah, it's a, it's a great it's a great podcast. And one of the there was a uh, sort of an award winning story writer there who was talking a little bit about communication and messaging and storytelling. And he was saying, look, if you go into ChatGPT or use Gen AI and say, look, write me a, a an ad story for uh, X Y Z, it it will reference all of the the sort of hero story that that you know which is there in abundance in everywhere the sort of you know the 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 rise of someone then the decline and then the 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 coming back to this massive you know win at the end but he said actually what what really makes good stories and adverts are characters it's nothing to do with the plot you know and he was arguing that that's almost almost an example of where creativity is a very human thing rather than and it's something that can't be recreated by say, say gen ai so he's almost arguing the case for the industry um not going into the hands of of gen ai um because there's this alarming stat that you know 60 or 70 percent of online content will be generated by ai within you know the next five years um but it's, it's just a just sparked off that that humanness that we're all we all need to be focused on um how you know in your you're a communicator alex you know you uh, you know tell, tell us a bit more about your background because you know you have a quite a unique um role and a unique sort of uh background when it comes to communication do you know it's really fun i've just so the talk i did earlier this morning was actually at a school and it was a careers thing and we had someone who was a tech one of the lead tech guys at aws someone else who was at wpp um which is the largest advertiser in the world um someone who's an investment <laughs> and then there was me and they had all of course done the usual a levels university got into a you know a fruitful career and um so how i got into and my background and the reason why i go there uh, i'm going there is because i stood up and went yeah i didn't do any of those things um i was always very good at two things um one was being analytical and one was being creative or uh, certainly curious um creatively curious I think maybe is a thing so I was I was great at biology and maths but also music and drama and had no idea what that meant for me in my future um and finally I found it which is that uh I basically use those theatre skills those communicative th th those creative skills those communication skills and teach them to people 
in finance. So I have both worked in finance. I worked at GE Corporate. I uh, founded and ran and sold an accounting firm. And then uh, and, that, and now I work with teams and professionals on their communication skills and, and as a coach. And so the way I approach it is both from psychology and also the fact that we're in theatre. So actually, I actually have a drama degree. I went to drama school. Um, and uh, it, there it is about you spend three years learning not just how to present on stage and speak well but if you are stood on a stage and you're playing a character you've got to understand the emotions you've got to understand motivation and plot and narrative and how to move stories forward and how to tell a story so much that it influences the audience and that when they leave you they have been changed in some way and then when I went back into kind of like corporate work I went, oh, that's what we're trying to do here in the meeting rooms as well. Mm -hmm. This is helpful. Um, yeah. And and I actually, I worked at universities as well. So I worked in education and training. And so that's when I, I branched out on my own um, and started my own business as uh, in terms of coaching and training um, people to be better communicators and use those human skills, as you were saying. So my background is slightly diverse <laughs> as, as you can tell <laughs> I think I that that's 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 brilliant and what as, as you were saying as you were going through that I was thinking when when you when you're now looking back it almost seems obvious right it, yeah. it's like I've got the you know I, I did I did biology I was good at biology I was good at drama I did these things and I've ended up here look it's magic um could, could, what what were you when was a have you got a sliding doors moment where you suddenly realized actually that's I've got that path open to me but actually this is the path do you know I I'm wonder I think it was a very slow sliding door <laughs> of, <laughs> of like it's easy to look back isn't it with hindsight yeah. and go oh of course and actually having spoken to these kids earlier today I was saying if you have different strengths and you're trying to figure out well what what degree is it that I want to do is it psychology I, I don't know is this a thing and the truth was that really uh without sounding totally cheesy I suppose a little bit ahead of my time is that the job didn't exist yet yeah. that I was going to how could I possibly train for it like I even did coding like I went off at uh, Thames Univer Valley University you could go and do a module modules and courses as part of their degree courses so in the evenings I'd go out and learn coding I've used it in every single job I've ever had and but that wasn't something that was taught when we were at school so I think sure. following yeah now if I'd have known oh you can be an executive coach and you can actually train people to use theatre skills but they don't know it's theatre skills <laughs> to be better um and make their companies better and it's like oh I, you know I think looking back the only sliding doors moment is actually more of a business sense which is I think having going what skills do you have and how are they valuable to someone else so it was about the fact that I go okay what skills do I have <laughs> okay I know how to do that how is that valuable here? Oh, okay. That's really valuable teaching someone, uh, you know, to be a better presenter, to be, um, to have a strategy, to be more influential, to pitch for investment, to do mm. any of those kind of things. Um, it's like, oh, they don't know how to do that. That would be really useful. So I think like any business, uh, you end up going, what do I know? And how is that useful for someone else? That's, that's, that's fascinating. I, I think that, uh, one of the things that you know, I might, my two sons, one's 15, just doing his GCSEs, one's 18, just doing his A levels, right? And they're, they're deciding on their paths. And I so wish I could translate and give them just some experience, just, just some, having done some stuff, because I think that if I'd done some stuff before I made some decisions at that age, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe I could have, shortcut to where I am right and I just and it sounds sounds very similar uh, it's interesting I, I love what you were saying there Alex as well about my job didn't exist yet yeah Wait, and then you know yes there, there wasn't a sliding doors moment but there, it sounds like there was there was a period where you were trying to find that ideal role and then that that actually maybe people caught up with you you know you were already trying to do that um, you know, how did you sort of tread water during those years? Because now, now you're good. But was there a period where you just felt I'm surrounded by idiots? I'm sure you were good. <laughs> I'm sure you were good back then as well. Well, it is. I think it's like any career you go through. You go through your early years, don't you? Cutting your teeth and learning what to do and what not to do. 
and gaining that experience. And so I worked at some amazing places. I worked at GE, I worked at Imperial College, uh, I worked at London 2012 and with incredible people. And I think the one thing that my family certainly always taught me um, who weren't corporate at all or business, they weren't in that world, they're in the creative world. And uh, was the, the power of making connections and relationships and learning, being scrappy, learning everything you possibly can from the people around you. And so I think I followed my nose with, well, what am I good at? And until, so the reason why I started my own business was that I, had, I was the head of education uh, at, a, at a training company. And then I, I was kind of like, after a few years, I was like, there's, there's, there was literally nowhere to go. There was nowhere for me to progress that I was directly below the CEO. And uh, I was like, well, what else do I do? I either go work for another company and I could, that could, that was an option. I could have worked in training in another company or I can build my own business. And that's kind of sounds, I'm, I was just turning 30. I was just about to get married and I thought, and I was just about to graduate as well. And um, so it taken me a while to, to graduate. So I was paying and working as I was doing it. And, uh, and I went, yeah, well, that, that sounds like the next adventure. And I've always wanted, I've, I had always wanted to run my own business and create my own thing. And I had a very clear picture of what everything could look like. Um, so, and, and do you know what kids today, part of what really surprised me is I don't think, I think like business sense in kids today is a lot more prevalent. Um, so I think anyone, and so like thinking about your son or anyone like looking at their careers and the jobs that don't exist now, I think that's what we actually have to prepare them for yeah. and what we didn't take action on. Um, I think in previous generations was going, well, we don't know what you're going to be yet, but how about you, you create these skills and you just do what, where they fit. Um, and so in the, so in, we're talking, I think they're like 14 or, or something like that in this, this crowd. And there are, uh, and the questions we're saying, we're wondering what questions the teacher said to us, don't worry, you probably, I mean, they don't really raise their hands and they were raising their hands. One of them actually said, you know, well, what should I be investing in? <laughs> and, <laughs> and one yeah. question, which what really- What crypto said, exchange. Yeah, should... <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, then, uh, and then one of them was actually, he put his hand up, this little kid, and he said, so, and he asked the AWS guy, um, because he was sharing some really, uh, slightly terrifying but fascinating things about technology and actually how old some technologies are that we don't know about mm. and uh, and he said will will AI be taking over my job <laughs> and I thought god I've been hearing that all year um, yeah. so, and this is a little kid that's uh, or teenager that's saying it um, so it, and then that was the conversation well what are you strong at work on that yeah well we've got to uh, we've got to keep an eye on um you know the talent that's coming into the workforce for sure and i i do think there's going to be a wholesale change in how we train people how we support them um and it's definitely not you know hierarchical anymore um i think we we all need to be learning all the time and i i love those those diverse teams um and cross functional teams back in those transformational days i'm con Conscious of time, so I'm going to just um, have a little uh, chat about a question that came in. Um, and if you are interested in asking any questions, then you can um, email us at podcast at generationcfo.com who produces this or reach out to Mike and myself uh, directly on LinkedIn. Um, and we had a question come in this week from Sam, who is a manager uh, of analytics and management information. And he was sort of asked that there's a lot going on in his world of data management, right? But I think that the, the final question was the really um, sweet question that he was looking up for an answer to, which was, how does the IT business relationship work in your organizations with regards to data? And I'd probably break those two things down. It's like, how do two teams how does that relationship work in any big organization how do they come together and communicate and collaborate and then there is this sort of subject area around data and where should it sit so mike i'll, I'll, I'll come to you first um you know you, you data management and and you know you work on a lot of data projects how do, how first of all how do you see that sort of business and it relationship working in big organizations and 
Uh, where does data normally fit in? Well, well that's a big question, right? Um, so I think oh, that's that's it, why Sam's asked it. Yeah, yeah, no. So, so <laughs> my 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 experience is in di- different organisations, it's different. But usually, what happens is data is seen as a thing that get that happens over there. IT is seen as a thing that happens over there, and it's a it's almost like a service that's provided in, and we'll let let the geeks go over there and do their thing. And actually, that's usually when problems start because everybody uses data all of the time. Everybody uses technology and IT all of the time. And actually, the key bit is the translator. Back to the translator conversation we're having a bit earlier. The key bit is that translator bit to make sure that the business, so the people in the business, can communicate with the data experts and the data experts can communicate with the people in the business so they understand what each other are asking and are trying to do. And it's similar with the IT function. I think that one of the problems that I've seen else, you know, in, in places is data gets put under IT and IT, you know, IT investments are usually on like a five year horizon. So you invest in something and it will last for about five years. And after five years, you need to replace it. The problem is data runs through that and carries on and on and on and on. And on. So people don't see the investment in data in the same way as they see investment in IT. So for me, it's about, it, to, to come back to what we've been talking about today, it's it's about how do you humanize that? How do you m- get this kind of conversation happening so people understand what their requirements are? Um, the short answer to all of that whole thing was it usually doesn't work very well. <laughs> yeah, I, I just weighed in on the data side. And then Alex, maybe you can sort of come in on the relationship side of things in corporates. But I don't think it matters too much when it comes to data. I I, I think, you know, data is a four-letter word, right? Nobody wants to own it. You can arguably have process owners owning it because they own the process. Therefore, the quality of the data that's coming out of it could be process owner. It could be in our IT. It could be in the business itself. I think when we were talking to Dominique a couple of weeks ago, she was sort of saying around analytics being a bit of a pawn that moves from, you know, finance back to IT and then back again. It really doesn't matter as long as we're getting what we want from from data. Um, but I do think that there is a problem in that these conversations aren't being had very much, right? Because that it because that people aren't working together. Um and, you know, Alex, what would sort of be your advice around, you know, if there were two functions that really needed to have a strong, positive relationship to nail something like data, you know, what what would be your sort of suggestions to the leadership there and the teams? I would I would almost not just look at the functions, looking look at it, because to be honest with you, I've seen this happen with various functions in in different organizations where Um, For instance, the audit team need to actually be talking to the sales team or the uh, and and vice versa. It's usually what happens is you've got someone who is, let's say, more creative or um, you have someone is or you have a subject matter expert talking to another subject matter expert. And the only thing is, is that they are going, well, this is important to me. Um, and and I can't believe you can't appreciate how important this is to me and I need to achieve this and why aren't you doing what I want? And that's really actually the question is how do you get everyone who is thinking what is important to them is important to them actually collaborating and working together? Um, I did, uh, and, and, and why I say it's not just to which departments, um, because this happens in so many places. I was brought in to work with... Um, natural capital um like there's uh, conferences and things like that and we actually used improv as a way of getting all of the the people the departments to converse with each other and that's because again like the soil person is interested in soil the accounts person is interested in accounts the uh, the, the finance person uh, investor is, inv- is, is is interested in the return and you know the um clean air quality person is is interested in that and they're so laser focused which is fantastic and what you want in those people but if they're not connecting with each other and the to be honest the really quick answer to that is that all you need to do is to get them to step away from what's important to them and focus on the common ground and what's important to them equally so for us that's why we used improv 
it was a case of, right, well, you are going to create a story using the topics that you specialize in, so the brainstorm things about soil and air quality and, and create a story out of it. Now, with improv, you have to say yes. <laughs> you can't ignore someone. You can't talk over someone. You can't um, uh, repeat their idea later. You can't have any ego, really, because you have to tell the story. It's all about all of you coming together to tell the story, no matter who gets the more lines or parts or anything. And they had to learn how to do that together and win together. Um, yeah. And this is the same with executive coaching. If you've got someone who is promoting like digital transformation, we need to be doing digital transformation and, and, and data analytics in our uh, business because we're going to be left behind. But the sales team were going, you're taking ages doing this and our clients are going to be really upset. And then, and then you've got a problem. And so in ev all of those situations, it's just, well, what do you think they care about the most? Yeah. Why? <laughs> Why do yeah. they care? Why does sales care about time versus quality? Um, yeah. Because that is, that's what they need to achieve. And that's their objective. You need to I'll... object quality um, and you don't have the time to do it in. And so it's just about understanding the motivations and what people are trying to achieve and see if you can ultimately serve the client or serve whoever in the best way possible and have that contact. I love it I love it I, I like the idea of a bit of improv I, I haven't heard of that you know Mike's a great facilitator and has a lot of tricks up his sleeves but I don't think we've gone to to improv yet have we Mike um, it's difficult it's difficult to do things that you're not comfortable doing yourself right and I'm not, like, mm, not sure about that I think I, I think I improv, I improv quite a lot but not stand up there don't tell me that. a joke <laughs> yeah. yeah exactly Look, um I'm gonna wrap up now so uh I have um I have got two things for good data bad data and I'm not not moving away from this because people are starting to pick up on this and you know hashtagging me good data bad data which is great but the first um the first one uh good data and this is a plug, I don't care. But Gen CFO Academy had uh, 1,200 regs, which is a whopping 40% growth year on year. Um, I I love that number. I love that data. And uh, may it continue. Um, a bit of bad data, though. My good friend Mike Rose has a bit of a catchphrase called, uh, "I'm," which he says, I'm not an accountant. Um, but the bad data is that Ivanka Trump who's testifying on the Trump fraud at the moment, uh, also has that catchphrase, doesn't she, Mike? Yeah, that's that was a bit of a shocker. <laughs> so um, I don't know who's going to have to change their catchphrase, but... Uh, I, think, she... I, think, I think I'll be around longer. That's my theory. <laughs> true enough, true enough. Well, look, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, Alex, that was great. It was, it was really good to sort of hear your, your insights there and... Um, Bring in a slightly different perspective to to all this uh, finance, di sorry, digital transformation chat. Um, and you know, we would love to have um, shout outs at this point in the podcast. So, if you are interested in uh, shouting out anybody, anybody that you know, anybody who's done a great job, anybody who's doing charity, which we've um, we've plugged before, then do uh, send us your uh, emails to podcast at generationcfo.com and um, the very last uh, shout out for, for me this week is to Mike, who supported the Academy this week and also the, the Gen CFO team. Um, they did a fantastic job. So Kira, Olivia, Ryan, Sophie, very well done. Uh, all of the speakers who were part of it um, because it was a it was a spectacular show. So um, thank you to everyone. And thanks again for being part of this. And um Mike, if there's anybody at the ODI that you want to give a shout out to, then, uh, then I was going to say the same thing. Actually, I was going to say I was going to say your team, but I was also going to say that the ODI summit this week was amazing, and the list is quite long, so I'm not going to go through it. But yeah, everybody that was involved in setting that up, it was such a great, great show. Okay, we'll we'll make sure that the millions go into the show notes. So sounds good. Anyway, thanks a lot. Thank you, Alex, and um, we'll see you again soon. And remember. It's not all about the numbers.